Um, so I'm delighted to present to you a paper called, it was a very kind of weird title, uh, Drilling and Death. Um, it is co-authored with, with Eric and Dad, and whatever is good about this paper is their fault, whatever is wrong is mine. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear the criticism. Um, so the motivation for the paper kind of stems up from a long line of literature that essentially asks how that factor of activity supports. Um, and traditionally, <clears throat> apart from just the source of financing, uh, there's a long line of, of literature that talks about the agency cost of that. We can talk about underinvestment or, or risk shifting, uh, which essentially creates kind of this negative effect coming from companies that, that, that have that. But the empirical work in this area is scarce. Okay. And um, since we know that the debt can bring some kind of agency cost, there's also um, a ton of literature and kind of the state and teaching contracts that are talking about debt renegotiations and financial um, covenants and collateral and what kind of a central ro uh, role those play in essentially mitigating those agency costs and, and allowing this kind of mitigation of problems that that debt can reduce. Right. So this paper actually going to follow in the steps and going to ask the question, can that lead to value destruction under the watchful eye of debt holders? Um, so effectively, in this paper, we, we explore how that affects actually having that, not raising that, but having that, affects the real actions of firms. And uh, what, what I hope to convince you by the end of this talk is that that uh, actually distorts the timing and the composition of investments by firms. Uh, these actions by the shareholders and the management are actually at the expense of a long, uh, long run returns and lead to essentially um, pursuing lower uh, NPV projects. Um, this behavior is most pronounced around debt renegotiations, and uh, what I will show you that in our particular setting, this behavior aims to enhance the collateral values. So, this is all great, uh, but why um, I started saying that there is very little empirical evidence um, uh, attacking this point is because we, we typically see three problems that impede research in this area. For one, it's very hard to observe actual actions of firms. So for, for, for an empirical system, for example, we can observe overall biology, right? But that incremental actual actions of firms is very hard to observe, actual projects that firms pursue. The second thing is that it's very hard to assess what the decision is about maximizing and what is kind of the clear counterfactual here. So uh, if you don't pursue this action, what other action you can pursue? And then there is also an issue that leverage is not actually exogenous, so firms actually choose leverage. So uh, the benefit of kind of empirical setting that I will um, tell you about in a second allows us actually to solve all these three problems because we do observe a project level data, project by project on the individual firm level. Um, we have a very clear counterfactual because we use Contango episode, and I know it's, it's a big word, and I'll, I'll tell you more about what uh, Contango means. And um, well, we do not have this great identification, but we have two types of the idea analysis, uh, difference and difference analysis that hopefully will, will mitigate some of the concerns related to endogeneity of leverage. So, First, why do we observe firm behavior at the project level? So what we're going to do in this paper, we're going to focus on firms uh, in oil and gas industry uh, that are operating in North America shale. So probably everyone heard the word fracking or hydraulic fracturing. So we are going to uh, focus on firms that actually explore oil, not gas, oil in North America using hydraulic fracturing, and we can observe data on project by project level for each individual well, okay? So um, as you probably heard, um, somewhere around 2003, there was a great breakthrough in science. And I'm gonna spend a bit more time talking about it because there is another fracking paper on the program, so I'm gonna spare the second author some time. Um, where um, the industry figured out how to drill horizontally and how to create pressure um, and through that kind of push the oil back up um, the shale, okay? So what is relevant for us is that this project typically goes into stages. First, they actually drill the well. So if you think about that black pipe, that's how they drill the well. The second stage, and, and that drilling of the well 
actually takes about three and a half million on average just to drill that well for each individual well. Okay, so capex is about three and a half million. And then uh, the second stage is to complete the well. So they install equipment on top, create a pressure, and then from the point they completed the well, the moment you create a pressure, right, you can uh, start extracting oil. So you can think about it like getting a sponge wet, right? So you get a sponge wet, that's the shell with, with oil, and then you create a pressure, you kind of start squeezing that sponge, right? Uh, so the geography of shale boom, these are the states where um, the fracking is permitted, so it's, it's quite diverse, right? And um, so, so that you understand, this is about six by six miles square. Every dot represents um, a lease, an oil lease, and every line represents that horizontal drilling line, right? So you can have about 280 of those kind of wells located on a six by six mile square. Right? It could be a few, but it could be as many as 280. So typically all of them are produce not that much of oil. They, they have a very limited shelf life from about two and a half to three and a half years. Um, and the investment of about seven million uh, produces from the beginning, oh, actually I do have it on a slide, give me one second. So from a month one, producing about $350,000 in EBITDA, but that gradually declined. Right, so the same way as you can think about the sponge, once you start squeezing it, the most water comes out for a second, but as you squeeze it further, less and less water comes out. So that gives us essentially the data on project by project decision, where we know exactly when the project was started and what type of project was started. Okay. Excuse me? There is no, uh, there is no variable extraction cost. The moment the equipment is installed, there is a fixed cost of labor. So variable meaning uh, proportional to production, no. It's, it's fixed for every well. Um, so the second component of our empirical design is that with this, we have a very clear counterfactual, in, uh, specifically contango, okay? So in about um, end of 2014 and early 2015, um, in 2014, I don't know if you remember, but the oil prices started falling rapidly. So by the end of 2014 and beginning of 2015, we had this episode of contango, very severe contango. And the severe contango is when the futures price is significantly higher than the spot price. So typically market actually is in backwardation where the futures price is slightly lower um, than today's spot price in oil. But that episode where the futures price was above spot price by about three standard deviations. So the futures price was way higher. Okay, so what this graph shows you is this is the futures curve. So futures price relative to the spot price in February 2015 based on maturity versus September 2014 before the contango, right? So it's a huge deviation. Right? So what is interesting in this uh, situation, okay, is um, if you look, that actually gives you kind of the um, uh, spot price uh, essentially for one maturity in a given period of time. This is for different maturities. As you can see, the contango was very severe over time, right? So it was not kind of just one day or one month. It was very severe for a prolonged period of time, okay? What is interesting is that in this period of time, the production, which is the um, green, bars, okay, did not react to a contango. If you think about it, why would you open the well um, and sell the oil today at a spot price? If you can wait for a little bit, right, and sell the oil at a premium of 10% or 12% or 14%, right? There is no cost to you to actually wait because storing the oil on the ground is the cheapest way to store oil. You don't need to rent facilities. You don't need to rent storage. So you can just store oil on the ground. Yes, sir. There's no time to build, because I don't know much about shell oil, but in, uh, in normal oil, if you scout oil, then it takes on average uh, six years to go build the equipment before you actually start. So again, uh, drilling, the first stage of drilling takes about two months. The completion of the well takes about a week. The completion of the well takes about um, a week. So just kind of put the equipment in, uh, frack it 
could take it could take three weeks, but it can take a week if you want to. So it's a very short period of time. You make a decision very quickly to complete the well, and you can start producing oil very, very quickly, right? So in a situation where you can get, and again, so the moment you create a pressure, so you think about it, the moment you started squeezing the sponge, letting go and stop squeezing, it means that, again, you have to buy the equipment and create the pressure again, which is expensive. So actually closing um, oil wells in fracking is prohibitively costly, right? So the moment you started producing, you have to sell that oil. And of course, you can store it somewhere. You can store it somewhere and sell at a future price, which I'm just showing you could be 14% higher. But isn't it cheaper to just store the oil on the ground? Okay. Um, and essentially, that's exactly what we're going to exploit. We're going to exploit this Contenga episode to, to, to look at the decision by firm to either accelerate production or delay production. And as you can see, this one actually demonstrates to you that how very little the differential in the profile could be if you just delay production by one month, okay? But if you look at the differences in NPV, and I don't know what happened there on the um, axis, but this, is, this graph essentially shows you that if you delay production by one month, two months, three months, four months, et cetera, okay? how much increase in NPV you would experience from that one individual project. So essentially, if you delay production by about one month, your NPV increases by about 5%. And please remember, there is no risk involved. There is no issues with arbitrage, so there is no problem. So you store the oil on the ground for free. Okay. So that gives us the project data and gives us a very clear counterfactual decision. Um, so that clear, unambiguous kind of factual during the super contango episode is that futures prices are much higher and the lane production is a positive NPV, right? So another uh, beauty that we have, since we have this very tight data on where individual project is located, we can also control for the quality of the project. So there could not be any explanation that explain our results stemming from different firms have access to different types of projects because we can control for about six by six miles geography, meaning these same firms are sitting over exact same oil reserves that can be exact, used, um, fracked essentially and developed using exact same fracking technology. Excuse me? And they are not competing because I just showed you that on a six by six mile radius, you can have as many as 280 wells. And the reason is because you can only extract oil along that one pipe, okay? That one horizontal drilling. So in fact, as you've seen on the graph, very frequently on the same lease, they drill in different directions, okay? So there is no competition among firms. How is solved in this particular piece of land when you're gonna start? Excuse me? Like, when firm make a decision, are they buying like, this piece of land? And yes, they do typically buy a piece of land, so indeed. So, um, in order to frack the oil, um, the firms starting in 2003 started buying land from essentially uh, farmers or landowners. And they can only drill horizontally under the, under the land that they bought. So, if they bought the land, they can drill horizontally. So, typically, um, the, the fracking kind of operation probably takes about two-thirds of this room, okay, square mileage. So it could be a very small square on, on kind of above the surface, and then they can drill into different directions. Okay, so the last but not least is I just told you about two things. First, the project level data that we can identify, very clear counterfactual. The third thing um, and the problem is this kind of endogenous variation of, in leverage that we typically have, right? And we do not have an instrument, but we have two difference in difference uh, setup that um, somewhat mitigate this concern uh, and actually impose a significant hurdle on any alternative explanations that could explain our results. So, um, so empirical design, this is essentially the DID. So uh, we're gonna look at the time to completion. So again, the issue for us, do we complete the well or not? Okay, um, and if we uh, in contango versus not in contango, right? So our idea is that in contango, you should delay completion of the well. Hence, we're gonna look at the time to completion um, in contango episode. We're gonna look at the high leverage firms 
And we're going to evaluate whether high leverage firms versus low leverage firms behave differently in this episode in, in, in Contango when they have very clear incentives um, to actually delay the completion of wells. So the univariate analysis uh, kind of suggests that um, our expectations are correct in the sense that high leverage firms are actually, the leverage distorts firms' decision to invest. Okay? Specifically, if we look at the five, uh, five different quintiles of leverage, and we're looking at the time to completion in months, uh, pre-super contango and during the contango episode, right? what we see is that uh, firms in the highest quintile of leverage are actually not changing their behavior, and they're um, continuing to complete the wells at the same speed at, at, as they used to uh, in periods of backwardation. Um, similar results uh, you can observe in the regression analysis. So the first coefficient um, suggests that, um, on average, in contango firms delay completion by about one month. However, that's not true for the high leverage firms. Um, at the bottom, so the leverage in uh, above 80th percentile. Um, and so what we observe here is very much similar to what we observe in the univariate analysis, that everyone delays completion by one month, but not the high leverage firms. What if they're just delayed in drilling as well as... So, so that's, that's a great question. So in order to eliminate that, and that goes back to a 30-minute presentation where I have to tell you a lot, of, uh, a lot of details about the fracking process, in this sample, we actually only consider wells that were pre-drilled, and the only decision that, that we're considering is the completion decision. So in a sense, we're tr keeping sample very clean. So we're not um, eliminating the decision of pre-drilling the wells. Um, so one can ask, so maybe this is a difference in other kind of characteristics on top of leverage that are potentially correlated by, with leverage or co correlated with firm financial health that might affect um, our results. So what we do here is we're looking at the difference in other observables such as profitability, um, right, size or market to book ratio such as growth to see whether those affect firm behavior in contango or affect our relationship with the document relative to leverage. And what we do find is that only leverage actually plays a role here um, in, in this situation. So um, this is essentially, excuse me, this is a difference in difference analysis where we compare a firm's behavior um, around, essentially, compare firms' behavior in backwardation and contango episode across high and low leverage firms. But we are actually blessed because in the oil and gas industry, the firms uh, have pre-scheduled renegotiations of their debt contracts. And they fall um, typically from February through um, April. So specifically, they fall right into that contango episode. So those renegotiation dates are pre-scheduled. So that gives us this magnificent other opportunity to create difference and difference analysis around renegotiation date. So we're going to look at high and low leverage firms. That's our first difference. But now instead of comparing contango versus the backwardation time, we're going to compare within the contango episode right prior to debt renegotiations and post debt renegotiations. What does it buy us? It actually ties the behavior to debt itself rather than any other characteristics. Right? Good. Uh, yes, sir. Um, no, that, so, no, they don't. So, because we draw the variation from the variation across time. Excuse me? You could ask, um, we have firm fixed effects. And indeed, we do have firm fixed effects, hence the leverage does not come as a regressor because it's fully absorbed by the firm fixed effects. We're drawing the inferences based on the interaction term. But I will try to repeat his questions, despite not having any voice, for which, again, I do apologize. Um, so now we're going to look, essentially, at um, completion behavior, right? the project completion behavior around the debt renegotiation dates. Every coefficient that you see up there represents the percentage of wells that firms had pre-drilled prior to Contango, the percentage of wells that they complete in each month, where each month is located now relative to renegotiation months. So you can think about month zero, that's the debt renegotiation months. Minus one is the months before, plus one is the months after. So what we see in, in this analysis is that um, high leverage firms complete 
21% of the, of the wells that they have pre-drilled just prior to debt renegotiation months. But during the debt, debt renegotiation months, they only complete 8%. In fact, we can, um, so if, if um, we want to think about the magnitude, right? So you can think about, so, oh, sorry, out of 100 firms. So if we can look at the regression analysis and we can observe exact same behavior. Um, so with the regression, it's, it's much harder to interpret because of the um, omitted variable, right? But if you think about it, um, the coefficient of negative 0.135 indicates that in the months of renegotiation, the percentage of wells that the firm completes drops by about 13%, which is quite significant given the, um, the uh, distribution of 100% over the seven months that we're considering in our sample. So um, what I've hopefully convinced you by now, right, is that high leverage firms accelerate production behavior so leverage actually distorts the investment decision in a situation where it's quite clear that investing in completing wells is not in the best interest of the firm. Okay. The next question is why this is happening, right? Because firms are presumably acting somewhat rationally for some reason. Okay. So one thing and most, most natural thing for us to think about is that they complete a well, they start producing oil, they sell the oil, so probably they need cash. So there is this liquidity hypothesis at work. Right? So the firms need to complete wells to avoid some kind of a liquidity crunch. Right? Um, the second potential hypothesis is the collateral hypothesis, because we have debt renegotiations, and potentially this debt, especially in the oil and gas industry, it's collateralized debt backed by oil in the ground. So maybe they're doing this to maintain their kind of covenants and collateral requirements that they have in order to maintain the same line of credit that they want. When you have a lease, wouldn't that count? I mean, uh, so they need to meet the collateral requirements, but you know, uh, isn't a lease enough? Um, because you have the asset, so I mean, you you know that you can get it. So what's the difference between having a lease and actually drilling in terms of collateral? And that, that is a great question. If you give me another three minutes, you'll see how actually drilling the well affects the collateral value of, of a firm and how it affects essentially debt for negotiations. One potential alternative hypothesis is that if you do that renegotiations, usually after the renegotiation, there is a limit on capex. So the creditor will say, okay, you can still invest, but only after I agree. And so what they could be doing is try to do as much capex as they can get away with before the limit kicks in. So try, trying to, to circumvent the future limitation on their investing, investment possibility by doing it right now. Uh, That's something I see a lot in That is firms. possible. I need to think about that hypothesis more specific to this industry. Uh, I've never seen in a debt contract in oil and gas industry the limit on CapEx because they essentially take debt to invest in CapEx. So it doesn't make sense to provide a line of credit in oil and gas industry to limit CapEx. So, but I need to explore this further to, to be 100% certain. But you see where it's coming from. It's a very different industry, right? So in, this industry is very unique because you borrow to invest in CapEx, right? So um, liquidity. The issue with this liquidity hypothesis is that actually to complete the well, one need to spend about $3 million. So on an average well where we have the cost uh, of well completion, so it doesn't make sense if you're in a liquidity crunch to pay $3 million today, okay, to generate about 300,000 um, of EBITDA tomorrow if you're in a liquidity crunch because this $3 million will barely be covered within a year of operation of the well. So it's highly unlikely that li liquidity crunch drives this behavior. So it's highly unlikely that what they actually need is just to cover their liquidity. In fact, if we look, when we looked at the current ratio, um, right, so we see the current ratio of about two and we see the interest coverage ratio um, of three and a half for those firms means they actually do have uh, cash flow on hand to actually cover their immediate obligations. What is uh, more interesting is the collateral, collateral hypothesis. Right? 
So in order to evaluate collateral hypothesis, we do three tests. First, we are actually looking at the high leverage firms and the type of wells they complete before and after renegotiations on a small size, a subsample of wells where we do have production data. So first, we look at the initial production. Um, and what you can see in this test is that before renegotiations and after renegotiations, um, it compares the initial production volumes for the wells, right? And what is striking here is that before renegotiations, those companies actually open wells that are more productive. Why does it matter? Is because the productivity of the well affects the value of the collateral. It affects the value of the collateral, uh, not only of the wells uh, that are already producing, but also of the nearby reserves. You can think about it, your bank, here is the oil and gas company. Obviously, oil and gas company knows much better about the reserves that they have because that's not your expertise. You can hire an expert, but it's probably going to be absolutely expensive. Okay. So what oil and gas industry converge to in assessing the value of the collateral, it's kind of um, assessing the value of the collateral using a um, few mechanisms. First, they look at actually producing wells, and those producing wells are um, depicted on this graph as solid lines. Okay. Those producing wells typically um, assessed at 100% of the present value of the collateral or at the production capacity. Then they looked at the wells that are drilled but are not yet producing, and those are indicated by the dashed line on this graph. If those drilled wells are located somewhere in the vicinity of already producing well, so I kind of assume that the reserves are very similar, so you can think about that big graph that I showed you, one lease, right? Multiple lines from the same lease. Probably, if you drill, I don't know, 100 meters away, you're probably going to have the same productivity of a well. So those are assessed about 60% of the value of the collateral. And then there are prospective locations somewhere nearby that are not pre-drilled, right? However, if you are pre-drilling wells, so which is indicated on this um, right-hand side graph in red, somewhere where there are no produ other producing resources, right, the discount is much higher, right? So they're assessing at about 40% discount. Um, uh, and that's because the asymmetric information is higher. You don't have nearby producing wells, so the asymmetric information is much higher. So now, the, uh, what you have a choice as a company. You can either complete a well um, on the, what we call the multi-well producing lease, right? And then the only thing that you're affecting is actually value assigned to just that one well. Or the alternative is that you can complete a well on a single well lease. So just create one well, first well on the lease. But that not only affects the value of the collateral of that one well, but it also affects the value of the collateral of a neighboring wells on the same lease. Because now it reduces asymmetric information about the quality of the reserves that the firm has access to. And this is actually what we can test. So specifically, we look at the single well lease um, for high leverage and low leverage firms and the rate of completion for single well lease. And we look at the rate of completion of multi-well lease. Again, if you complete on a single well lease, that's where collateral values are affected the most. If you complete a well in the multi-well lease, that's where collateral values are affected the least. Okay? And what we find is that most of our effect that we document in a paper is actually coming from a single well leases. So what this result suggests is that the high leverage firms um, in the contango ex ex kind of environment, they're striving to increase the value of the collateral to continue to have access to funds, right? And as a result, they invest in projects uh, that are effectively negative NPV, okay? I'm, um, if, you, if you look at the magnitude of this effect, uh, we will find actually that the aggregate effect is um, mountable to about 2% of equity value of the high leverage firm, so it's quite significant. Yet, I would be very careful in saying that um, it leads to value destruction by, for, for the firm itself, because while it is a negative NPV project, it actually provides firm access to um, collateralized debt, and there is a ton of literature studying with um, the most recent is the uh, um, Bergman and Begmelek paper that essentially says that collateralized debt is much cheaper. So it is possible that our firms are, by completing these projects, they're kind of paying for collateralized debt by uh, acquiring this collateral, and then they're compensated by lower interest rate on the debt. So overall, what we find in the paper is that high leverage firms engage in actions to pull forward the cash flows, okay? These uh, actions are at the expense of a higher return long term, and 
Um, so this is about 4.8% of an NPV at the project level, or about $124,000 per project, and we have about three some thousand projects that are paid in, uh, in a sample, and um, about 1.2% of equity value, okay? Um, we do observe that this is happening more around debt renegotiations, which again suggests that it's more debt-driven mechanisms rather than anything else. And it, um, it aims to enhance the collateral value. I think, can I ask questions or? Yes, sir. How many of them have gone out of your sample? Like what's the typical outcome of renegotiation? Uh, so a typical outcome of renegotiations is that they experience, um, um, so typically the borrowing base is renegotiated during um, those renegotiations. The borrowing base is essentially the maximum amount that the firm can pull out of the bank. So this is a kind of line of credit. That borrowing base is determined based on the value of the collateral. Okay. So renegotiations changes the borrowing base. It also changes the schedule of interest rate that um, a bank can command. Uh, on the line of credit because as the rate of utilization, so the more and more you borrow out of, the, of your credit line, your interest rate goes up. So uh, renegotiation leads to that, that change in the, in, in the um, uh, borrowing base, first and foremost. Effectively, it, it, you can think about it, your credit card. So renegotiations, if you don't have enough collateral, it, it lowers the limit on your credit card which essentially limits firms' ability to invest in CapEx because uh, that's what they're using the credit lines for. Either I was seriously boring or my voice scared you. I don't know what happened. So I have this uh, thought. So you claim that uh, it reduces information asymmetry, right, and gives access to this collateralized debt. So you have you know, several leases as a firm, and uh, you, know, you need, so I mean, it makes sense that you're gonna you know, do this uh, uh, one well lease. Uh, so presumably, out of those many leases, you're gonna pick the most productive one, which is what you. Yes. And uh, essentially, you're fooling your creditors, because let's say that you know, there is an average value assigned to all of your leases. Uh, and the uh, value for the remainder doesn't change, but you know, you're just picking up the uh, most productive ones. So essentially, you know, if the creditor actually knew what you were doing, it should have uh, reduced the value of the remaining leases, the ones which you haven't you know, drilled in or, or haven't shown that. Uh, you know, so essentially, I just, uh, you know, it seems to me that there is a, uh, friction and, and uh, irrationality on behalf of the creditors, right? Because they should reduce the value of your remaining leases, the ones which you did not uh, you know, produce, because they must understand that you have selectively picked just few you know, highly productive ones. You're, you're absolutely right. The, the, and that goes back to kind of eternal question in finance. If there are no frictions in the debt market, then all of these contracts should be clearly, easily renegotiated, right? So what I showed you right now, it's, it's very clear to the banks that um, it's, it's in the Contenga episode, there is no asymmetric information between banks and the firms that delaying production is beneficial for everybody. So it should be easy for the bank to be able, presumably, it should be easy for the bank to renegotiate the contract, right? However, we experience something like a debt overhang issue in a sense that banks are unwilling to renegotiate for whatever reason. So anecdotal evidence for me when I talk to banks in Texas, they essentially say, we have a procedure, right? And we are not gonna change the procedure and the reason we're not gonna change the procedure because it's too expensive for the company to change the bank. So there is a holdout problem. So if you think about it, um, I'm not gonna change it, I'm, not, I'm unwilling to renegotiate as a bank and I know I'm going to retain the relationship because it's too expensive for you to switch to a different bank who will have to go through all the re-evaluation of collateral values of your wells, okay, and provide you a new line of credit. So, indeed, if, if we live in a perfect world where everybody knows everything and everybody is willing to act rationally, okay, then this problem should not exist, period. 
Okay, and that essentially, so that's an issue where it highlights a friction where banks are unwilling to renegotiate, okay? And while we cannot empirically prove it, our, our belief in this paper is that the industry is structured in a way that there is a holdup problem because switching costs are too high. So, is that uh, you solve the problem by increasing information asymmetries between the creditors and, and the firm, and not reducing them. So, so the issue with information asymmetry and where those percentages come from, let me, let me, give me one second. So where these percentages come from, it's actually SEC, uh, the OCC guidance, the Officer of Control on the Currency guidance, on how to estimate the value of the collateral, and this guidance is actually used to assessing banks' capital requirements, okay? So banks already have the guidance to assessing their capital requirements that are following this procedure. It's not a law, it's a guidance, so banks can still deviate from it, but they might find it too expensive to deviate from that guidance. So this is a great question. Again, if, if the world is transparent, we should not observe this. If the world is transparent, right, and you have a relationship with a bank, and everybody, it's clear to everybody that delaying production, right, is value enhancing, creates extra value that you can share, we should not observe this problem. But then it brings to the question, why don't the banks just liquidate? Why do they renegotiate? Because you have this very That's simple, homogenous asset. F fuck these guys, I'm just going to sell the wells and take the money. That why is, would I renegotiate? That is a great question, and that goes back to why do we have dead, dead of a hang problem, right? So that the dead of a hang problem was documented some time uh, ago. We know the evidence of dead of a hang, and that falls under the exact same argument. Why can bank renegotiate? So this essentially highlights a friction in the debt market. So what I'm arguing here is that we're highlighting a friction in the debt market that leads to ir irrational investment decisions, okay? So we're actually presenting you a very clear evidence, right, that high leverage can affect the way that firms invest in a very negative way. And I, I agree with you. I, like, it should not exist if everybody's ra acting rational because nothing that I showed you is actually asymmetric information or unclear cut. Yeah, but, but, but in, in other firms, the idea is often, yes, but assets are specific to the firm, to the sector. Banks cannot easily sell it, and that's why they have to renegotiate. But in this case, it's very homogenous. So, so, so there's less but, reason to have this deviation. Right, but we also have to... Uh, remember, okay, that while the asset is fairly homogenous, the management team is not. So we can actually put forth some kind of a moral hazard type arguments and say, me as a bank, I don't want to renegotiate with you and give you a high line of credit without you actually um, developing resources because what if you're going to have this newly, newly found access to capital and then you're going to take this capital and deploy it in a way that is not actually value enhancing, right? So we can have some kind of manager-driven moral hazard type issues here, right? So on top of kind of the switching cost, right, we can have that story as well. Maybe it's the depositors. Well, yeah, maybe it's the depositors for no, the rational no, no, ones. No, because, you know, you see, so you have these guidelines, so presumably they protect the depositors. So maybe, maybe, uh, Look, and, and, and again, um, I cannot, so there are essentially right now we have, we've aired in this room three potential mechanisms. Maybe it's the OCC guidance that is the rational one. Maybe those percentages are not the rational one. They kind of tie banks' hands. It is possible that there is a manager-driven moral hazard issue. It could be the switching costs. I cannot really present you with empirical tests to tell you this is, this is the mechanism. I call maybe on this audience to do it, but what I'm hopefully showing you is that there is a friction, it affects firms' decisions uh, in a negative way, and we should pay attention to this. So we should not treat that as a kind of this magnificent device, right? It can lead to distortion in the investment decisions. And this is as close as, as, as we can come to documenting it because we overcame most of the hurdles in this literature in this paper.